Hello and welcome to a campsite. No, not really. It's the Dakar Rally. I reckon this is the greatest motorsport event on earth and I want to show you why. <laughs> This is brilliantly random. That is the start of the Dakar Rally. Cars just tear off, you get covered in stones, there's no safety barriers or anything, and they're gone. Can you, can you hear something? There's, there's something. What is that? Is that just the wind? No. There's something coming. It's gone. You just hear these noises coming in on the wind and then go again. So this is how you spectate at the Dakar. You drive for two hours to the middle of nowhere. You then wait for another couple of hours for anything to happen. You're told the cars are coming from over there. Then they suddenly appear from over here. And then you try and guess what it is. And it's one of the pro drives. Look at the thing go. That's so cool. Right, come and have a look at this. It's the Hino race truck. Now, I just want to show you how robust these things are. If you look down at the back wheel, the back wheel's held on by 10 bolts. It's still a leaf spring at the back, but look, twin, massive twin dampers. And in the middle, it's got a, bump, a hydraulic bump stop and then more polyurethane bushes to stop that leaf spring overextending. It doesn't actually look like it's got that much travel. But look at the solidity of like the chassis rails and the whole frame of it. It's just, what a piece of engineering. Love Dakar for stuff like this. It's amazing. What I love about Dakar is there's sort of, you can get in around and see everything. Imagine being able to doing this with Lewis Hamilton's car. But look, you can get in and around it. You see the guys are all working on it down here. Look at the stand of this. This is where the spare wheel goes, in here. And underneath here, it's all, well, the engine's in the front up here. There's no room inside that cockpit whatsoever. Watch your feet and come with me. So because there's all of the logistics and stuff that goes into Dakar, it's amazing. So up on top of here, you won't be able to see because it's dark, are a whole bunch of roof tents. These are probably washing lines, I expect. There's roof tents for the mechanics to sleep. And then if you come around through the back, through between the trucks, and then we have to cycle this way, I think, down behind them, there's a whole load more sleeping quarters for the mechanics back here, because once their work's done out there, they've then got to get some shut-eye, and then probably the next day move the entire encampment, pack everything up into the trucks to go to another bivouac. So look, here you go, a whole load more sleeping quarters along here. These are the mechanic sleeping quarters. Have a look over there, you'll see some camper vans. That's where the drivers sleep. These are carbon Kevlar. It's bulletproof, but look at the tears and the rips in it. This actually isn't crash damage so much as spray from all the, um, from the stone chips and the sand. It's sandblasting. And this is the damage that gets put into all these, all these bits of pieces. Look at these, look at the brake discs from it. And look what it says on them. Scrap. <laughs> it's f good for nothing but the rubbish dump now. Or recycling, I'd hope. It's just astonishing the punishment the cars take out here. And that's why Dakar's amazing. <laughs> Look how many people are around. Don't let anyone tell you that Dakar isn't a spectator sport. The risk is you don't know where to go. We've now tried standing on three different dunes and we've had buggies come through here, we've had them come through there, over there. Then we have them turn around and go back that way. It's quite chaotic. So I know it looks like the cars are just razzing through the sand dunes, but there's actually a lot of science to it. A few years ago, I did a desert rally in Morocco, 
and the guy who was running it took me out into the sand for a day just to walk me through and try and show me what the difference is in the sand and I know so little but here's a big one you see the ridge line here it's wind blown so you can see on this side there's all the ripples it's nice and firm but if you put a foot over the other side it's really really soft and it's difficult to get your footing so for the cars they need to stay on the hard stuff and as soon as one car has been across and started to break that surface layer up you'll see if you break up the surface a bit it's much softer underneath it's just that first bit so the first car is fine after that it all gets much softer underneath but the best thing you can do here though is go for a run down a dune because that's a laugh yeah <laughs> It's firm at the bottom though, soft on the way down. Nice and firm down here. Well, <laughs> oh, why'd I do that? I've got to come back up now. <laughs> <Back. laughs> so once all the cars come through, you get the buggies and then you get the trucks. And because they all run together, they sometimes get mixed up. <laughs> but the best thing is, those trucks are nine tonnes and because they sit so high they can see over the dunes better so they're coming through here faster and getting more air than anything else. So when all the cars are finished, no what am I saying, not when all the cars are finished, they're still, the stage is still live, it doesn't close and there's still cars coming through, but the locals come out here and bring all their cars out. And it's not like they're all brilliantly well suited for this. There's, some of, there's something like a Nissan Sentra bombing around over there. There's been all sorts of random stuff just tearing around. And you also see quite a lot of near misses. Yesterday, there was a bloke turning around in the stage just as one of the cars was coming to him. Then there was about 100 camels heading around across the course as a truck was coming through. It was carnage. So late afternoon in the bivouac and it's a hive of activity. As you can see, there's lots of cars sort of coming and going as bikes probably coming back from the stage as there's people going out to the fuel dump, which is over there somewhere. Lots of stuff going on and lots of stuff going on just around in this area around here. So over here, Cyril Dupre's cars being worked on. That's, there's all various banging and hammering and stuff and people using air, air jets to clean all the dust and the sand and everything out from everywhere. And then if you come over here, there's just some really cool cars. Look, you've got an original Peugeot 205 T16 here. And what I can only assume is an old 404 pickup. It's just awesome. I had to come back and have another look at this 404 because something about it was bugging me. It wasn't quite right. So I got talking to the driver and I want to show you this thing because it's just fabulous. Right, come around here. So I thought it was possibly a little bit wider than, a, than an original 404 was, and it completely is quite a lot wider than an original 404. But if you look down here, you can see it's running on big struts and double wishbone suspension. And if you come along the side, you have to work your way around here slightly, you'll see, look, there's plexiglass windows up here. And then at the back, massive twin shocks and everything else. It's, a proper bit of kit in other words and you're thinking wow that's an enormous amount of work to go to for an old 404 but if you come right in here you'll have a look at this you see there's a frame in here that's not something they've just loaded into the back that's an original Mitsubishi Pajero Dakar Rally Raid racer so what they've basically done is got a whole load of body panels to make this look like an original 404 which is absolutely brilliant. Now it's part of, this is part of the classic rally and it runs slightly differently to the cars, trucks and bikes and so on. They all just go flat out, it's all against the clock. For these guys it's what's called a regularity rally where they actually have to hit the time checks as accurately as they can. So it's not just about flat out speed, it's about hitting the average speeds that you're meant to. So look, you get given this document and you here you've got your, your kilometre markers here and the times you have to hit all those checkpoints and these are the average speeds on each section that you should be aiming for so they're between they're not sometimes they're not fast they're like 55 65 kilometers an hour that's like 35 40 miles an hour but sometimes these guys have to go fast and depending how you how competitive your classic is 
is how fast those regularity checks go. So this guy doesn't have to go too fast. The guy in the 205 on a couple of the sections today had to average 90 miles an hour, 150 kilometers an hour for several, for several kilometers. It's not like just bit and you're done. He had to go quick. And then this is the other book that's interesting. This is your tulips. This is how they actually navigate the rally. These are your kilometre markers and these are the pace notes basically. So this is not done by plug it in your GPS, hit your navigation go and just follow the dots. The co-drivers have an enormously busy job on the Dakar. Think about the whole logistics of running this. It's unbelievable. So let's go and see if we can find a bloke who can tell us more about how this place operates. This is Christophe Puginier, who is the head of logistical operations for the whole of the Dakar. Because I know you think Dakar happens in the sand dunes, but actually it doesn't. It happens here. This is how the whole place runs. And this is the man who can tell us all about it. So Christophe, Tell us about the bivouac and how it, how it operates. Well, the bivouac, it's basically a small city, you know, a small village of yeah. 3,500 people living yeah. here every day. So we have to provide them like everything they need. So it means food, shower, toilets, uh, space to park their uh, vehicles, yeah. uh, to live and to rest, mm. to sleep. So yeah. basically, it's a small city. There's not just this one bivouac, no. is there? Yeah, no. It has to move it's as a, the race moves. Definitely, it's a moving city, basically. And we are moving almost every day, except when we are making the loops uh, in the, the sports uh, area, mm. okay? Uh, so we have to move everything, except yeah. the big structure uh, that uh, remain uh, at the bivouac, okay? Yeah. But for all the, the other things, we are moving. We are moving all the trucks, the buses, uh, the food, uh, well, so, everything. So there are six bivouacs at the Dakar this year, is that yeah, right? Yeah, this year it's six bivouacs. Six bivouacs. This kind of structure, which is a very huge one, yeah. needs like 10 to 12 days to set up and dismantle. So we don't have time to move every day uh, that kind of structure. That's why we need to have set, six sets of that kind of structure and some few other ones. Yeah. yeah. And how do you get, how do you transport it all around? You pack all this down to go on a load of lorries and goes off to the next bivouac. Yeah, definitely. We have like transportation means, so trucks, basically. We have like around a, a bit less than 100 trucks that are moving <laughs> all our uh, stuff. And how many people roughly are working for you just on the logistics of getting the race around the country? Yeah, along the year we are a small team, okay. But when it comes to the Dakar, so grow, we are growing, growing, growing. And then with all the suppliers that are working with us, we are like five to 600 people working for the Dakar on the really? logistics side. Yeah. Wow. But, and how does this stuff all get here? Because it's not just the bivouac, is it? You've got to get all this stuff and all the race cars and everything else all have to come yeah. to Saudi Arabia. So basically, we are trying to work with local supplier when it comes to big structures. Okay, but for example, the cars you, you were mentioning, the cars of the competitors, mm. we are bringing them by the vessel, by vessel. Okay, so they come on a boat from France. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. we uh, like uh, rent two <laughs> big boats, and we bring all the stuff and materials and cars here in Saudi Arabia. So, so all the race travels here on a couple of boats from yeah. Marseille. They come from Marseille. Yeah, from yeah. Marseille to Jeddah. So yeah. this operation took place like in end of November, beginning of December. And yeah. then we bring everything in Jeddah, we unload everything, we prepare everything. Then when all the people and the staff and the competitors are coming, mm. they take their cars and their stuff and then yeah. they do the race. You know? Fantastic. Yeah. And but as well as, so you got the boats to come in, but you, we see like helicopters flying around the place. Are those all part of your yeah, one task of, as well? Yeah, one part of the logistic is also the aerial means so the sky basically yeah. okay so to do the race the race needs helicopters helicopters to make the medical evacuation in case of injuries yeah. okay but we also need helicopters for the tv mm -hmm. uh, and then helicopters for the press photographers so basically we have 15 helicopters walking uh, around the race every day so we need to provide them also fuel for example mm -hmm. uh, so we need to make recognition during the year to know where we are going to put the fuel station over the race, over the country. Yeah. So we are using helicopters, we are using three planes to make the relay 
for the transmission of the race. We are using also planes to uh, make move our staff. So it means yeah. that every day we are moving 500 people from a bivouac to another by planes. So we are renting three or four planes to uh, move our own people every day. Wow. The bivouac at Riyadh is 50 acres and that's the minimum. They cannot get everyone into a smaller area than that because there are 550 entries in the race this year. It's the biggest Dakar ever. <laughs> <laughs>